Bonaparte looked at a bunch of snakes, realized that there's a whole bunch of snakes, in particular in Europe, that are not obviously venomous. Um, they don't have a viper-like body plan. They don't look like a bow or a python. And so he basically stated, these are the typical snakes, and then came up with the word colubra, which comes from the Latin, which literally translates from to snake. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. For this episode, I am pleased to have Dr. Zach Lofman returning to the show. I think last time we talked, which is a very popular episode, was back in December 2020. So if you haven't listened to that, I highly recommend going to listen to that first because I think it's a good foundation for this episode. But in this episode, we discuss his new book, which is titled The Natural History and Captive Care of False Water Cobras, Barons Racers, Musaranas, and Other Xenodontine Snakes. It is an absolutely fascinating book and has created a ton of excitement and buzz online. I want to say at the top of the show right now, in case you miss it at the end, if you are interested in this book, which I don't know why you wouldn't be, make sure you send Dr. Zach Lofman a message either on Instagram or Facebook. That information is in the YouTube description or the show notes. So again, if you do want to purchase this book, make sure you send Zach a message because he will send you a copy. So this episode really is just a small sample of what can be found in the book, but we start out today's conversation with taxonomy, colubrid taxonomy, colubroids. We discussed the superfamily colubroid, the, of course, the family Dipsatidae and the subfamily Xenodontinae. What the heck did I just say? Well, if you don't know what that is, this episode hopefully will reveal some of that for you. There is quite a great story with taxonomy, how it's kind of been whittled down over time. And Zach tells a beautiful story within the book. And we also sort of get through that here in this episode. So hopefully this episode will give you a little more of a deeper understanding on taxonomy in general. Even if you aren't interested in these groups of snakes, this discussion on taxonomy, I think will help you visualize and understand taxonomy on a deeper level. And the latter half of this conversation really focuses on false water cobras, their natural history, and their captive care. Enjoy this conversation with Dr. Zach Lofman. Well, Dr. Lofman, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Um, very happy to be back, Dylan. Thank you. It's it's a great time. Obviously, I think we were just talking about two and a half years ago, you were on before. I can't believe it. The time mm-hmm. just flew by. It was incredible. But you yeah. have an exciting book coming out that we're, we're going to get into because it is... I see the posts getting shared a lot all over Facebook. So clearly there's like this uh, baseline excitement. I think as always is when we have like a herpeticulture book that comes out that we know is going to have some potency. So everybody's looking forward to it. I am so excited to record this podcast with you to talk about it. Uh, let, let's just bring me back to the decision because everybody knows uh, you are an incredibly busy person. You yes. spend your life as a biologist and a professor and you even outside of reptiles, you're doing things with crayfish and whatnot. What made you decide to write a book? That is a great question. So uh, I, I, my professional life is nestled within academia. And I am one of the few people who's, who's privileged enough, I guess, to be able to come to work, teach young people about biology, animal science, conservation, and of course, reptiles and amphibians. And then I'm quite literally one of a handful of people who actually gets to teach at the college level a herpetoculture class. And I, I I think about this almost daily, like, how did this happen? This is amazing. Uh, and so given that world that I dwell in, uh, it, the way that we kind of manifest all of our efforts is by picking some kind of subject and writing about it. And, and so I had done this ad nauseum with crayfish i've been publishing with crayfish literally for the past almost two decades uh and 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 what was neat about that is like well well crayfish kind of came in late in the game reptiles and amphibians have always been a part of my life like Mm -hmm. from the time i was small and when i was in elementary school middle school high school uh my my mom was an english teacher and so i was surrounded by books books have always been present And it was just kind of a bucket list thing for me to do to write a book on herps. And so I have a small book that I've written on crayfish. I have a bigger book that I'm going to be writing on crayfish. But it was really important for me to write something that was herpetology minded. But at the same time, I didn't want it to be for herpetologists. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be for like the 19 year old version of me um, because hitting that target audience of like the super dedicated reptile nerd for lack of a better word that that's learned the latin and learned all the ecology and learned all the biology there that that person oftentimes is a really hard audience to make happy because Mm -hmm. you either write 
too technical and it bores people to death, or you don't write technic like with enough uh, respect for for the knowledge base of of those people, and so they're underwhelmed. So I, I just kind of had the twenty year old version of me in mind, and I thought that's my target audience. And then the other reason why I wrote a book is. Uh, in zoo science, I, I, I don't have imposter syndrome. That is definitely not it. It's just I I felt like I needed to do something. Like if I am the guy in charge of this and I'm an academic, I need to have some kind of tangible bit of street cred <laughs> that that makes me worthy of the, the title that I have. Mm -hmm. And so a book seemed like the most logical avenue for me to achieve that. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, and and just from the little bit that I've read of it, the, it it it's amazing how you've it, it does really feel like it's a herpetoculture book because you'll be reading it and yeah, it does get scientific and you kind of you're getting into the weeds, which every nerd is just super excited about because yes. you're just like, wow, this is fascinating. But then you dial it back to remind the reader that this is for the reptile keeper it's just, on several occasions from the two chapters that I read, and it was just it was almost like nice to hear because yeah. because when you're reading a scientific w work as a reptile keeper, you can, it doesn't always tie back to keeping. And sometimes you can mm -hmm. even go away from keeping, right? The, the people yeah. might not want you to keep reptiles at all. And it's almost like a relief to go, oh, yeah, no, this book is for us. This book is for somebody yes. who does want to keep these animals. And I think you did that perfectly. Oh, well, thank you. Well, one of the most difficult parts of the whole process actually was just kind of finding that voice, like kind of hitting the target with what my goals were. Cause when I, when I started writing, I was I just come off of writing a bunch of crayfish species descriptions of all things. And, and if you want to talk about something that will put you to sleep and reads like tax code, <laughs> yeah. talking about in great detail the anatomy of a crayfish cephalothorax, man, it is not riveting. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's riveting for the 12 of us that study crayfish. Yeah, so wow, this is a page turner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and so when I started writing, it was like super technical and I, I would like I would write it, write a section, and then I would just look at it and be like, this is too much. And then I was I thought you got to dial it way back. And so I would dial it way back. I would dial it back too far back. And then I would write the same paragraph and then I would read it and I would basically be like, no, this is nowhere near. So it actually took like three to four months of me writing. If you if you have the book or get the book, it's the Musarana chapter. That was the first chapter that I wrote. Um mm -hmm. But that chapter just took – it was draft after draft after draft after draft. And then inevitably, I kind of hit my target. Um, a lot of my students said that whenever you write a book, you need to write a book the exact way you teach your lectures. And so you know, I, I basically found myself sitting in my office at home or my office here almost like saying out loud what I was writing like I was lecturing to the computer screen, which was a little bit weird and odd. <laughs> to do but um i i think in the end after uh, yeah it took me a while but i hit the target and then i just did everything i could to not lose that voice like i didn't write any crayfish papers while i was doing this i was reviewing my master's students theses um i was writing some reports but i was avoiding that like technical jargon uh that uh, world that i dwell in so uh, like at, at all costs so i could just kind of preserve the voice in my head to get this thing done and, and get it also. So it was kind of all the same voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That makes, so that's hard. makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Even if you're writing something short, you can like go back. You're like, am I the same, yeah. like the same voice that I started this paper with? Mm -hmm. So I can imagine writing a book, especially when you have like such a catered audience is that, that would yes. be difficult. So tell me about the topic. You want to write a book. Uh, I mm -hmm. think anybody who knows you knows probably why you landed on this. So maybe it's more of an <laughs> obvious thing, but maybe you could yeah. just, for those who aren't familiar, what, what made you write this, this book? Yeah, well, the, the backstory on the Xenodontine book is actually kind of, kind of fun. Um, I went to a conference. Uh, the only time advancing herpetological husbandry had a conference in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in, in Rodeo, New Mexico, the Cherokee desert museum, uh, Bob Ashley's place. And when I went to that, conference uh i i got there i met bob obviously eco publishing is is a thing and i had been talking to him through email about writing a book on all uh, on actually crested geckos of all things because a lot of people don't realize that when i came back into herpetoculture i'm a snake i've always been a snake person but uh 
I wanted to get into a group that involved naturalistic keeping and I could do bioactive vivs with live plants and all that. And I, I, I was dart frog scared the hell out of me. So I just jumped right in to um, Corlophus, the, the crested geckos. And I, I went in hard like we all do. And uh, I, th that that whole street cred thing we were talking about, you know, here I am in charge of this major and, and we're I'm doing herpetoculture professionally, academically. And so I thought it'd be cool to write the book on crested geckos. So I, I, I wrote a proposal and gave it to Bob and he responded with, yes, the complete guide to crested geckos. I was going to write that book. I now know how incredibly naive I was mm -hmm. to even remotely entertain the idea of writing the Bible on crested geckos. Uh, so I was standing there talking to Bob about that. And I basically was in this weird space where I was trying to back out of that book, uh, <laughs> because the crested gecko community, uh, is enormous. Um, if you're going to write that book, you're going to have to dive into morphs. I'm not really a morph person. That's not my jam when it comes to herpetoculture. And a lot of people would want that book because of the description of all of the morphs. Yeah. So I was talking to Bob staring at the mountain if you've ever been to the museum and and i said you know i really kind of don't feel comfortable writing the crested gecko book i'd love to write a book on on snakes and anyone that's talked to bob knows how this conversation went because he just turned to me and was like yeah do it and i'm like what <laughs> and he's like what do you want to write on and i and i thought in my head uh immediately false water cobras and then i thought no one's gonna buy that book and so I thought, well, they're dipsadids. So what's a dipsadid everybody wants to keep? Hognose snakes. And I love hognose snake. Like that's that's one of the critters that I am totally into. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, standing in the parking, like right outside of his, his deal, well, what if I did the complete guide to hognose snakes? And he said, well, let me check and see if that, that one's taken, but I'll get back to you. And then he wrote me an email and he said, go ahead and do it. And so then I went back and forth with him and I thought, okay. I can add, I can make the title of the book a complete guide to hognose snakes and their allies. And that was the way that I could get the false water cobras into the book. And so what I, I mentioned this to Bob and uh, he said, well, you know, OK, that's fine. Just make sure it's mostly about hognose snakes because you know, there, there probably aren't going to be that many people that are going to want to buy a book on just false water cobras, which is a very valid point. <laughs> yeah. So I thought. That was in the fall of 2019. We all know what happened in the spring of 2020. Mm -hmm. So I, I was navigating the pandemic like everybody else. And so fast forward to the fall of 2020. And then that's when I thought, OK, you know, I got to get started on this. And so I, I started writing for the Hognose book, the Allies section. And so that's why I started writing the Musarana chapter. And so it took me a while to figure that out. And when I got the Musarana chapter done, just the Musaranas, it was like a four, it was a 30 page document with a whole bunch of photographs. And I thought, OK, it's all good. We can cram that into the Pogno snake <laughs> yeah, book. The one then, ally. <laughs> yes. Then I wrote the false water cobra chapter and it ended up being like 50 pages. So now we're up to 80 pages of text and we haven't written a word about hogno snakes. And I knew that Bob didn't necessarily want to publish a book on xenodontines because it was a little bit of a, a, a risk financially. And so um, I, I, I called him up and said, I'm just going to do the Hognose book. But before I do the Hognose book, I need to learn how to write a book. And so that's basically one of the major goals of this effort. But I had to find a publisher. So I looked at Amazon. I didn't want to go that route, uh, mostly because I don't like the quality of the, like the not the, the the actual physicality of an Amazon printed book. To me, if they get wet, they kind of disintegrate. And so I was looking into self-publishing and then I reached out to Russ Gurley because uh, I had met him at that conference uh, in the fall and I knew that he had uh, living art publishing. And I said, hey, I uh, kind of want to do the Xenodontine book. And by that point in time, I had the whole thing. Well, I had two thirds of it written. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, send me what you have so far. And I sent it to him and he said, I'll do this. And the rest is history. And so uh, I wrote it primarily over 2021 uh that was the main period of time that the bulk of it ended up getting written and it then i i famously said in a message with a group of people including justin julander um i'm done 
And then that was like early 2022. And he just sent like a laughing emoji because, oh, was that like the understatement of the universe? Because I was not done. <laughs> it was almost like you're just beginning at that point in time. So, so. that's, you know, 18 months yeah. ago type thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's I mean, I whenever I would see you post pictures of you yes. writing the book, <laughs> I would think I, I don't think my brain can focus on something like that because you just had papers everywhere and you're writing. Mm-hmm. I, just, I can't imagine how daunting it is to actually sit down and write something like that. Yeah. Well, th- that's where my my training and in, in being a biologist that writes the journal article, like that's just what we do. Mm-hmm. So it it wasn't at all painful for me. Uh, I am an epic nerd and I love and I say nerd as a term of endearment, by the way, it is not yeah. at all a derogatory word in my lexicon. Uh, but I loved every freaking part of this en- endeavor. What did you love about it? I, I I loved digging deep. I I, I with I, I love diving into the literature. I love taking all these skills I've learned as a biologist doing the crayfish work and then applying it to the to the herps. Mm-hmm. Um, I really loved finding out everything I didn't know. Like that mm-hmm. was that was crazy. Like I threw the ego out the door immediately because I knew that some of these things were going to be challenging, and I knew especially with the systematic stuff that keeping tabs of all of that in a chronological order and all the names and who did what, like, and telling that story in a way where it could be interesting. I knew that was going to be hard, but it was just fun to figure it out, get it down, and then write it in that voice that people might actually find it interesting and possibly entertaining. Mm -hmm. But, but for me, it was actually a release. Like I, uh, there were a lot of things in my life in that COVID era that, you know, you run away from screaming, but I was usually trying to clear my schedule out so I could get an hour here and there to you know, dive in and, and get one of the paragraphs figured out or learn about a genus of xenodontine snakes that I didn't know anything about or learn how this one's related to that one or figure out some aspect of care that I didn't quite understand. Like the whole process was absolutely wonderful. Well, and so you'd written the Musharana, you'd written the False Water Cobra chapter, and at that point mm-hmm. you decided, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on a Zeta Dante book. But what did you know what it was gonna be? Because it's, that's kind of a that even that's a big task as yeah. far as like wh- how what are you gonna write about? You wrote the two chapters, and then how are you gonna tie it together uh, to make a cohesive book? Yes, I, I didn't necessarily know that at at that early phase. I knew that I wanted to write the book on the the main species. Of xenodontines, and we can get into what a xenodontine is here in a minute, but um, that are maintained in herpetoculture. So here in the United States and across the pond in Europe, the species of snakes that are kind of all related, they come from South America, that we would consider to be the, the xenodontines that are in herpetoculture. False water cobra is probably the one that most people know most readily. Right behind them, I would argue, is the Barons Racer. So Barons Racers have a chapter, and, and they're they're their relatives, uh, the Musaranas. And it, it's not, when I say Musarana, it's boy Runa. That's, um, some people call it the false Musarana, not Clelia Clelia, which is the big Musarana people find when they go to Costa Rica or Central America and parts of like Peru, places like that. Uh, I also included um, the genus Xenodon as a chapter, which are the tricolored hognose snakes. And that was a fun chapter to write because. I have the contract to write the hognose snake book too, but a lot of people think that those animals are related and they're right. actually very distantly related. They just are an example, a beautiful example of convergent evolution because they kind of share similar niches where they live. And then the final chapter that I, I, I was going to write on was a group of snakes that I maintained and are definitely maintained more in Europe than here in the United States. And that's um, this genus, it, they used to be in the genus Lyophis, which is actually one of the most speciose genera of snakes on our planet. But um, a molecular bio- biology paper kind of found out that that genus actually should be put into another genera, Eurythrolampris, which at when that move happened, Eurythrolampris only had like five to six species in it. And then in, like in, in the blink of an eye, it ended up having over 40. Mm. So in herpetoculture, we refer to that them as Lyophis, but in reality, the Eurythrolampus. So I, I wrote all those chapters, and I had them done, and I was just like, there's something missing. Like, th- there's got to be a trunk that ties this whole thing together. And I knew what it was, 
I just was kind of like, I don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole. And that was the first chapter. And I basically decided, oh, what the hell, let's go. And <laughs> and that's when I basically explained to the readers what a dips added is, um, what that word means. And, and I, I I tackle the family colubridae. We all say colubrid, but what many people don't realize is there's two ways of view. There's, there's a handful of ways of interpreting that family. And one way is that it's actually... Uh, not necessarily one family of snakes, but a whole myriad of families of family of snakes. And one of those families that would masquerade under that name Colubrity was Dipsatidae. And so I had to kind of explain that whole scientific process. And then within Dipsatidae, there are these three subfamilies. And one of those, the subfamily Xenodontinae, that's the subfamily that has all the snakes that the book's about. So I had to go into all of that. Mm -hmm. And then in order for people to even remotely understand what the hell I'm talking about, I have to describe what subfamilies are and tribes and family. <laughs> and so it ended up being like this wonderful <laughs> heterogeneous soup, my favorite phrase, of absolute snake nerdom. Like that was that was what it was. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever written and worked on. And at the same time, one of the most fun things I've ever worked on. I mean, I, I, I bought all these old papers books and papers and trying to keep it all you know in order but yeah it was a ton of fun well and, and that that first chapter is so i'm so glad you decided to write it because it's so needed yeah. and, it, and it clarifies the rest of the book but it also just like you said if you're a nerd you're just gonna love it because there's lots of things like understanding the different nomenclature for the latin that's used for family and and um and family and gene or not not genus uh, i guess what what is it family not we had families, subfamilies, tribes, and oh, yeah, no, yeah, sorry, sorry, it was subfamilies. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it was just just yep. the different spelling of family and subfamily, mm -hmm. and just how to remember, and, and then tribe as well, and just how to, you know, be able to read that and know exactly what it is just based off the spelling. I thought that was cool. So that is something that you can transfer over to, you know, however yeah. however long. But anyway, th 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 that's fascinating stuff. I have one more question just about writing the book, and then we'll get into some of that taxonomy sure. ta taxonomy stuff. It, it must. What does it feel like now to have? The, the book's going to be out there. Is it released in October? I forget. Oh, oh it's it's released. Um, oh, it's out the, now. Okay. We we we've been able to get all of the copies that have been purchased that aren't the signed and numbered out. Mm. The big issue is getting the hundred signed and numbered copies out. Um, because we got to get you to those books. Yes, and the books have, have they they have they have made it to me. Now I've got to find time to sign and number them, and now I've got to get them back to Oklahoma, and I'm in West Virginia, back to Russ, and then. <laughs> Some of them can't get signed until we go to Tinley. So it's 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 been a little daunting, but we're going to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. So, so that part will happen. Mm -hmm. But it, yes. what does it feel like to have this really important piece of her herpeticulture literature now in part of the, like, you know, part of our community? It must feel good. It, it, the, it feels nice to know that the people that like these snakes, which are kind of underdogs within herpeticulture, you know, we, we, we have a resource now, which mm -hmm. is kind of fun. Like, I always think about the complete carpet python, uh, yeah. Nick Mutton and Jewel Ender's book, uh, because the, the Morelia community, you know, they can go to that book. If they've got questions about the biology or the, the husbandry. They have a resource. And the Internet's great. And you can go to, you know, Facebook groups and you can download journal articles off off the Web. But there's just something very iconic and classic about having a book in your hand that I don't care what the Internet does. It will never take the place of having that book, that tangible, you know, resource in your hand. And and I'm certainly not saying that my book has, you know, solved that problem, but it's contributed to the knowledge gap and, and people can now go there. And, and the fun thing is I followed the format that a lot of the complete series follow where there's all the biology in the front part of the chapter. And then that leads into the, the herpetoculture section at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I, no, that feels great. It, 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 it is. I mean, obviously there's a peer review process with the book. So it's, you know, there's so many reasons why a book is a little bit more worthy than a, you know, a Facebook post, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it just, like it's so nice to have it on your shelf and just be able to quickly flip to a, a chapter where you're like, you have a question and like, I have a few of those books here right behind me. And it's just, mm -hmm. there's something nice about that. So I think that that's pretty cool. 
let, let's jump into the weeds of that first chapter because I <laughs> yeah, think sure. that this is, you're right, the people use these terms all around, clubrids, clubroids, and maybe mm-hmm. don't fully understand it. I definitely didn't fully understand it until I was reading that chapter. I'm like, oh my God. That first chapter <laughs> is like an emotional roller coaster because I was kind of taking notes <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this is how it's classified. And I'm like, nope, the next paragraph deletes mm-hmm. all that. Okay, so do it again. And then I would write it. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to read the whole chapter before taking notes. <laughs> but why don't we start with just the mess of clubrids, kind of how that began and mm-hmm. sort of what Kluber's originated as and why it became so messy so quickly. Yes. So a, a fun fact for people listening is Kalu- the, the, the family Kluberdi, uh was initially described by a guy named Bonaparte. If there's any birders listening to this, you're going to recognize Bonaparte immediately because there is a gall, Bonaparte's gall, that occurs throughout the Great Lakes region and along the Atlantic coast. Uh, but Bonaparte was a, a, a relatively famous French naturalist. And, and and back in the 1800s, it was kind of a it, it was a fun, it was a practice of the biologists of the day to just kind of grab on to any group that somebody hadn't necessarily described using our good friend Linnaeus's new framework for describing things with binomial nomenclature and all of that, and then you know, write a, a quick paper, publish it, and basically establish yourself as the the guy that did the initial taxonomy. And so Bonaparte looked at a bunch of snakes, realized that there's a whole bunch of snakes in particular in Europe that are not obviously venomous. Um, They don't have a viper like body plan. They don't look like a bow or a Python. And so he basically stated, these are the typical snakes and then came up with the word Calubra, which comes from the Latin, which literally translates from to snake. And so that's where it's a great family name for the Calubridae because they are, forever been known as the typical snakes or the classic snakes or whatever you want to call it. And, and then, you know, from there, it it, it 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 starts with typical snakes. Well, think about all the snakes that can <laughs> fall under this moniker of typical. I mean, it's insane. It's everything from Natrix, which are grass snakes, up to like dice snakes, to Montpelier snake. I'm thinking about animals in Europe. And so it was very common at that point in time to assume snakes aren't overly complicated. They're a head, a neck, a body, and a tail. So we're just going to basically put all these nondescript snakes under this family colubridae. And, and that's what happened until people figured out how to actually differentiate them beyond fat, venomous snake, skinny, non-venomous snake. And that was where you, you kind of get into male genital anatomy. If you're going to, if, if you aspire to be a snake taxonomist, you better prepare yourself for looking at an awful lot of hemipenes because yeah. the hemipene anatomy is is where you get the, the the real differentiation at a family and genus level. And so the guy who starts to kind of figure that out is is a guy named Cope, who was a paleontologist. Um, if you know about the Bone Wars, which is kind of a famous thing in dinosaur paleontology, Cope was that guy. Cope was a character. And so he's the guy that kind of starts looking and realizes – yeah, there's some some differentiation going on with the, with the genitals here, and and he takes that and and runs with it, and he's actually the guy that realizes that colubrids uh, are probably multiple lineages, which basically means that there's all kinds of diversity herein, uh, and then from that, you know, that's when the arguments start. Is it more? conservative and we have colubridy with all these subgroups underneath it or are these subgroups actually their own families and they deserve to be recognized as such and Mm -hmm. and teasing that whole thing out in a chronology from random bits of information was a lot of fun and at the same time really hard yeah i can imagine (laughs) yeah one thing when i'm reading it and and this is the same sort of feeling i get when i read other work of you know linnaeus or anybody who's describing species in those early days i just don't understand how those people had were able to expose themselves to such a a large volume of animals you know like i don't even know if like do you know how that works like what what the hell yeah no this is what they were doing they were relying on the victorian biologists the 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 field people basically in the 1800s were were all over the world. So what was happening in the Victorian era is you had these natural history centers or hubs there. You had, and they were all the natural history museums. So you have the London Natural History Museum, the Paris Museum of Natural History. There were natural history museums in Spain. 
Uh, and at the time, the American Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of Natural History, and even things like my local museum, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, they're sending out naturalists, biologists, and they're they're going out into the world, and they're basically grabbing as many animals as possible, um, dispatching them, preserving them, and then they're shipping them back to the museum. Mm -hmm. And so the way that these biologists get their hands on all these specimens from all over the place is that process. Uh, and, and so, you know, somebody sitting in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History, they can be receiving boxes on a weekly basis from Suriname, Guyana, Costa Rica, Mexico, Arizona. And so they're basically receiving this stuff and then feverishly trying to write and get it described before the next guy gets it described. And, and what that environment did is it basically, it made for... A, an environment where you're going to do some somewhat sloppy science because you want to get your paper out first and get your names out first so that your names are the names that are recognized ultimately. Right. And so that's part of the process. Now, fortunately today we don't really do things that way. <laughs> um, we still use those specimens that were collected in the 1800s um, in the early 1900s. But, you know, today, if you're going to be describing a, a, a taxa, it's almost certainly going to involve a, uh, a DNA component and you're going to be, you know, adding a lot of objectivity into the mix. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different process today than it was back then. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's really fascinating. I mean, it, it, a, the, it's it was interesting in that chapter, watching it kind of refine as we move mm -hmm. through time, which is really cool. I mean, that is what science is. You start with this kind yep. of gross idea and then it sort of becomes more specific, which was really cool. But you know, you'd already mentioned the hemipenes and that, that was sort of reiterated quite often <laughs> in that first chapter. And I, I kept me, I like, I kept wondering, why? What in that piece of anatomy do they decide to throw higher in the hierarchy when it comes to differentiating <laughs> species? Is, I mean, maybe the hemipenes has a you know, it, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm sure it happens oh. in crayfish all the time too, right? No, there, there's a form of speciation in zoology that zoologists under you know, have have defined and described, and we refer to it as lock and key speciation. The um, male genitalia is the is the is the key to the lock, which is the female genitalia. So there's a whole myriad of animals where they're the bodies of the animals between species look really similar, but the way that they're able to differentiate each other at a species level is the male genitals of one species don't fit into the female genital genital track of another species. So this lock and key speciation mechanism is important and snakes have undergone that to a certain degree it's it's not as extreme as what you see in many species of arthropods but at the same time uh the hemipenal structures are super important and so early on herpetologists figured this out and even to this day when you describe a new species of snake if you read those descriptions there's going to be a description of the male hemipene because it's it it, it has proven out with genetics uh oftentimes to be taxonomically significant mm. And so, a pretty easy visual cue to, mm -hmm. to look at. Yes. So, so let's talk a little bit about your the sort of that lumper versus splitter mm -hmm. as, as far. So, as of right now, is it still contentious, or is it is the way it is? I guess it always is. It is definitely still contentious. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not going to name any kind of names. There are people that would read that first chapter that I wrote in herpetological circles, and they would basically be be saying, "Oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes." There are going to be scientists that read that chapter and basically say, what the hell is he talking about? Absolutely not. And that's just something that you you have to accept. So what I did is I just read all the evidence. I picked a, a, a path or a lane, and that's the lane I stayed in uh, throughout. It's important for people to know uh, if people were to interpret the results or the papers differently than I did, they might come up with a different conclusion. Um my ultimate conclusion was I felt like there was ample evidence, but primarily genetic evidence that supported there being multiple, many of these, pri these, uh, these taxons that were prior to, you know, the molecular evolution given subspecific status. Now we're, we're kind of recognizing them as, as families. And, and the main reason for that is with the DNA work, if you, you create a, a phylogenetic tree, 
and I put a couple of phylogenetic trees in there for people to see. Mm -hmm. if, if, if all these organisms kind of come back to one spot on a greater tree of life for snakes, they form what we call a monophyletic group. And if you have a monophyletic group, that implies a unique lineage, which basically implies that all these animals have a common ancestor. And so, you know, there's ample evidence as far as I'm concerned that clearly demonstrates that the dipsatids have one kind of common ancestral group uh, and they radiate out from there. Just like with uh, garter snakes, water snakes, grass snakes, keelbacks, we call those animals natricids. Uh, there's quite a few herpetologists now that recognize the family natricidae. Uh, back in the day, it would have been natricinae, a subfamily underneath the family colubridae. So, right. you know, we're, we're basically kind of moving forward with that. So do you think the family colubridae will slowly disconnect itself into being almost nothing because as as of right now we have the, you know we have this sort of super family of colubroid yeah. which has everything underneath it but it sounds mm -hmm. like things are slowly being snapped off the colubrid yes. family into their own um, families the, the family colubridy i think will will absolutely stand the test of time uh, there are several anatomical or morphological attributes that that particular group of snakes have uh many of them completely lack a Duvernoy's gland, um, which is the kind of infamous gland that equates to a venom gland in the dipsatid snakes. Uh, many of them have unique vertebrae anatomy, lung anatomy. They all kind of, many of them, not all, but most fulfill a similar ecological niche. They're rodentivorous, bird-eating, um, large constricting colubrids. And, and the genetic evidence this you know absolutely supports them having monophyly. So mm -hmm. things like rat snakes, milk snakes, king snakes, um, the spiloides, rat snakes, all of those guys, and then a whole uh, dry marken, the indigo snakes and crebos, you know, all of them kind of form a, a really nice monophyletic group. Mm -hmm. But what what it comes down to is just how you interpret the data, uh, and there will always be subjectivity in this. We can never get it completely to an objective manner because a lot of times what many people don't realize with the phylogenetic trees is that you as a researcher you have to pick a model that that tree is going to basically be created from and there are some models that are very that are going to create very conservative results which are going to glump everybody together and that would be kind of like a lumper model and then there's other models of evolution that are going to split things way out that would be a splitters model and then there's a whole bunch of models that are kind of intermediate. Uh, and that's where the peer review process and herpetology comes into play uh, to kind of keep everybody honest and, and, and you know, agree upon. But I have found what's interesting about my history taxonomically is I started off a hard core lumper. I was as lump. Uh, I, I did. I did not understand why things were being split as much as they are. Then I actually was forced into the world of systematics and taxonomy with all the descriptions I've done with crayfish um, and learned an awful lot about the process and the lines of evidence. And I wouldn't say that I'm a splitter, but if I had to pick a camp, I kind of lean a little bit more towards the world being more biologically diverse than we previously thought. Mm -hmm. So so this is definitely a book that kind of takes a splitting argument, I would argue. Yeah, uh, but but I don't dive you know head first into that. So and so for the listeners, that is just the dipsatids were an initially just a subfamily under colubrids, and the way that you presented yes. the book is that there's enough information ge genetically, geographically, and morphologically to actually yep. bring them up to the family level, and then have subfamilies underneath it, which is when we start to bring in the xenodont today. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, for me personally, like I. I couldn't, I don't think I have the personality to be a lumper because I just like things to be in categories, you know, like yeah. things that are just different. It's like, that's a different thing. There's just enough, yeah. of, enough of a change. So maybe mm -hmm. you could, like, what are some of those physical characteristics that the dip dipsatids have that support sure. the family, uh, the family classification? So they, they have several characteristics. A lot of them are anatomical. Uh, I mean, th there's absolutely common anatomy with the hemipenes. I mean, if you want to get into like, if you're going to go full nerd snake taxonomy, you will be talking about male genitals. It's just the reality <laughs> of the situation. And there is uh, a, a, a somewhat common anatomy to the hemipene 
that when you find a random snake and you look at the hemipene, you can identify it as a dipsadid based off of that. Mm -hmm. um, the another attribute that's that's more fun to talk about <laughs> is that <laughs> almost all dipsadids are rear fanged. They, they all are opistoglyphous. Um, they're all going to have teeth in the posterior part of their mouth that are larger than the teeth in the front of their mouth. They're almost all going to have a groove on that tooth that then kind of is analogous to a duct that leads to a very specialized gland called the Duvernoy's gland. And the Duvernoy's gland is, is uh, the equi equivalent to a venom gland in some species and in, in some tribes like the Phylodryani, which is what the Barons racers uh, are, are members of the Phylodryani. Yeah. Those guys have like crazy glandular tissue up there. I mean, when you look at cross sections um, underneath the microscope, it it has all the anatomy of a venom gland. And then other species, it's just uh, a sac that produces some proteolytic enzymes that are are released. Uh, so they have this um, the secretion, you could argue, venom delivery system that's not pressurized. So they have to rely on physical pressure hitting the mouth to then compress the gland to push the secretions out into the, the oral cavity. So that's a very unique system. Um, most of them, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are egg layers. So they're going to be laying uh, eggs and they're good at laying eggs. Uh, they oftentimes produce large clutches or they multi-clutch, which basically means, and anybody that's kept tricolor hognose snakes knows what I'm talking about. They'll drop eight eggs and then a month later they'll drop eight eggs and then a month later they'll drop eight eggs. Mm -hmm. and, and this is because most dips added are going to be to some degree ecological specialists or sorry, generalists. And so they're, they're going to be out there in the environment. There's going to be a large predation pressure acting on them. And so to counter that, they just simply saturate the environment with babies. And, and, and that's kind of an ecological attribute. I just want to take a short break from today's episode to thank each and every one of you for tuning in today. If you would like to show more support for the podcast, you can do that by checking out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. The other way you can show support to the podcast is through the Patreon account. For as little as 75 cents per episode, you will automatically be added to the Discord server so you can communicate and chat with other like-minded keepers. If you do bump yourself up to the $5 a month tier, you'll have early access to the episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Again, I am so grateful for each and every one of you. This podcast is a lot of work and costs me a lot of money each month to run, and any support coming from your end is greatly appreciated. Back to the episode. Right. Yeah, and, but to me, it just seems like with the, especially the teeth and the Duvernoy's gland, like that seems like such a lar a significant piece of anatomy to separate them from, mm -hmm. you know, the typical clubrid snake. Yes. Yeah, so and, and, and Yeah. And, and, and if you kind of get in the weeds of what will ultimately be the family colubridae, most of those snakes are, are kind of powerfully built. They rely heavily on constriction or they just simply grab a prey item and beat it to death like a indigo snake or Kribo, mm -hmm. or they simply grab a prey item and eat it like a right. Spilodes would. Uh, yes. But with all these families, what makes it difficult is there's always going to be outliers. And in taxonomic speech, the outlier is going to be like that one example that kind of goes out on an evolutionary trajectory and does its own thing. So in, in the, with the Xenodontines, there's a genus Thamnodynastes, and uh, it's also a tribe. And there's members of the th of this particular group that have live birth. And so you can't yeah. say all dipsadids lay eggs because we have some of them that are lying that are, you know, that have live birth. There's the hydropsini, which are the these aquatic xenodontines that for all in the world are identical to the crab eating snakes and uh yeah, the the homolopsid snakes that are present in Asia. And so you know, these things are almost fully aquatic. Uh, and, and so you can't make these absolute statements. And the reason why is the xenodontines are just so flipping diverse. Um, that makes them very interesting to me. Right. And so 
with the Dipsatids, we have the subfamilies of the Xenodonte. There's the, there was the, I guess the Dipsatidae. Yeah, or there's, Dipsatid, there's Dipsatidins. Yeah, we have the, the, the family Dipsatidae. And then currently, as they're understood, there's three subfamilies under that. And we have the Xenodontinae, which are primarily in, of South American, you know, they're, they're, they're the South American Dipsatids, basically, is a fair statement. We have another family, though, that makes that statement a little bit false, which is the Dipsadinae, N-A-E, which means subfamily. And, and this group, they're primarily in Central America, but thanks to Panama and the land bridge there, there was an exchange. So you have some Xenodontines that are in Central America and some Dipsadinaeids that are in South America as well and vice versa. And then when you get up here into North America, where we're at, we have the subfamily Carf Carfionae, which includes things like Carfophis, the worm snakes, and Diadophis, the ringneck snakes. Those guys are kind of related. They're, they're not kind of related. They are related, so they kind of make a natural group. But there's also the North American dipsadids are the troublemakers because we have things like Ferantia, which are the mud snakes and rainbow snakes, and then Heterodon, everybody's favorite, the hognose snakes. And when you look at the genetic results for those animals, they, they clade in that North American group, but they don't really... They, they don't clay it in a way where it shows a strong relationship with the ringneck snakes and the worm snakes. Mm. And, and so you know, all this tax, this taxonomic quagmire to me has just been insane. And what was kind of fun is by learning all of that for this book, it just prepped me for writing the hognose book because I've got a, there's going to be a great big chapter on taxonomy and that book and systematics and that book as well. Yeah. Yeah. It is really mm -hmm. fascinating. And, and that's the thing too, is it'll never be, black and white perfect yeah. categories because that's just not the way biology works it's always going to no. be a spectrum and so sometimes it's like trying to shove a circle into a square <laughs> hole by putting these yes. things in but and then just as far as the the species irradiated over time through the evolution i think if i was understanding it correctly it seemed like it started in north america well i mean it started in asia and yeah, well moved over well that's that's what's fun because we don't really know um within the dipsadid group we know that the, the Xenodontines probably were in South America and they probably radiated from South America up with the kind of American interchange. If you understand a little bit about biogeography and zoogeography, there's this time when North America and South America kind of crash together and that's when Central America creates a land bridge. And that's when you get this exchange. But there's some genetic evidence with this here, here again, the outlier of the group, this genus of snakes called Thermophis, which is in Asia of all places, and another uh, genera of obscure Asiatic snake is also in Asia that's a dipsadid. Um, you know, the question is like, how the hell did they get to Asia? So uh, there was some evidence with those animals that maybe they came from Asia down in. Uh, I think right now the leading bit of evidence points towards South America northward, but in all ultimately we may not ultimately get the answer to that anytime soon. So, yeah. but that's the fun thing about writing a book like this because it's, it's kind of maddening trying to get it all right. There can quite literally be one paper published and what you just wrote all goes to crap. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that happened to me. Like this is, this is crazy. So um, the chapter that has without question, the craziest systematic section is the chapter that I did in the bar for Barons racers, because I decided that I wanted the readers to understand all the different species of snake that are it, that are related to Barron's racers. And in South America, they're oftentimes referred to as green tree racers or green racers. And oh my good God in heaven was teasing out all of that mess fun. And I had I finished that section. It was January of 2021. And I was going through my notes and I realized I tried to talk about every species at least once. And there was at that point in time, a species called Phyllodryas amaru. And I, I was, I, I read my section on the systematics. It was like, damn it. I didn't mention this snake and I don't know who it's related to. And I don't understand. And there was a, a paper that had been published in November that I was really leaning on heavily. And so I, 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 I did a Google search and I, I want, I can't stress this enough. This was the last thing I was doing after spending a month and a half doing this. And up pops that species of snake, but it popped up in Google Scholar. 
And I thought, what the hell? And then it's in this publication. And I click on the publication and it's another phylogenetic treatment of this tribe. And I thought, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like I no. did, is this a new paper? What is going on? And then I looked and, and now you can get people will, will put up their paper before it's actually published. It's called a preprint. Mm -hmm. And it was a preprint of a published of a paper that had been pub accepted for publication. It had been put up that day. So the day that I finished writing, another paper came up and it was a paper that was basically challenging the paper that came out in November. And I, 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 I had that moment where I just kind of sat there numb to the world because I was like, oh, my God. And that paper, of course, was radically different than the paper that I had used. And then I had to figure out, like, which paper am I going to pick for yeah. this chapter? And, of course, it was the new one. It wasn't the old one. Uh, <laughs> and I had to start all over again. And, and, and um, yeah, it was somebody when I was telling them that story, they said, uh, you finally got a taste of your own medicine. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they were like, yeah, when you, like, describe a new species of crayfish and I learned it as this species forever. And then I, I I find out it has a new name and I'm like, why the hell does what's going on? And I instantly think, damn you, Zach. And I was like, yeah. okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I understand it now. Okay, fine. So now, yeah, so, you get to feel that next time yeah. you go to scrap uh -huh. a crayfish, you're gonna be like, maybe I shouldn't do this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but, uh, but yeah, no, that was, that was pretty intense, but at the same time, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do and the changes yeah. were made. Well, and yeah, so that just shows you how complicated the taxonomy is. And I think uh, we've mm -hmm. probably dug into it enough just to get people like, yes. I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. So people yep. should go read that chapter because it will really clarify things for you. And it's just it's just fascinating to read it and to understand it that way. And I think let's jump into your favorite species, because I think that yes. really is the origins of this book or a lot, totally a lot to do with it. Book. So, so mm -hmm. I, I think most people know you got into false water cobra as part of the, you know, with the lab that you're working with at the university, but maybe just give everybody like a two cent or two, two minute, just quick sure. of what, w working with them. You know, the origin story, it's been stated on many a podcast, but uh, in the fall of 2016, um, that was when we were moving forward in zoo science, the major that I am in charge of here at the, at the school, it, it basically went live that semester. And I knew that I was going to dive into this head first. I knew I was going to be doing research in the upcoming years and I, I I knew my personality well enough to know that I I I needed to have some projects where I was kind of dabbling with things, but I also needed to have one kind of focal species that was going to be the main push of my uh, herpetocultural efforts uh, with the writing, and then of course with experiments down the road. And uh, I was sitting on my couch. Cat, my wife Kathy had gone to bed, uh, and I was just kind of going through my phone on our, our good friend fauna classifieds in the oddball colubrid or other colubrids group just seeing what like the weird snakes were if you know what i'm saying and up popped a false water cobra and at that point in time i knew i had this uh, this idea that false water cobra is based off my time being a herpetoculturalist and being into herpetoculture in the early 2000s i i i remember being told they were aggressive I remember being told they don't do well. I remember being told they get to be huge. And I remember being told they were like as venomous as a timber rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, perfect to bring on to a college campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I was, I was sitting there and I, but you know, I like my semi-aquatic swamp animals and this was definitely that. And I like, I, I've always liked animals that, people don't really gravitate to even within groups of animals that that people don't gravitate to like you know so snake people really didn't gravitate to false water cobras if you, if you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and so i thought okay i'm gonna do a little bit of digging and so i i just did a little bit of digging and it was almost at the time i'm gonna find the evidence to make me not do this like that's what i went into and then of course i started reading about them and i found some of the journal articles i that i ultimately read and are in the book um and everything I was reading was kind of countering that argument, which was real dangerous because mm -hmm. if the argument wasn't true, they were kind of the perfect snake for me, given my interest and in, 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 in what I wanted to do with herpetoculture. Uh, and so I I spent about two weeks. I didn't just impulse buy, but I, I read a bunch 
And I actually found a Facebook group of all things, really academic, but at the same time, it it was very interesting. And and I've I've been a member of this group forever, and it's actually a really good group. Uh, False Water Cobras is what it's called. And I got into that group and was looking and and kind of reading the post and seeing what the keepers were saying. And uh, they seemed to be a bit different than what my perceptions were. And so I located a breeder in Pittsburgh and uh, he said he had one left. And so I said, I'll take it. And I drove up. Classic herpetoculture story. Met him in the tattoo shop. (laughs) Exchanged money. Got my first false water cobra. And the rest was history. Like uh, within 24 hours of having that snake, I cannot explain to you how hooked I was. Um, It was it, 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 it that was in I think January of 2017 and I uh, you know it was it's literally been just an uphill climb since then so yeah because I mean you're yeah. obviously the the number you're working with has expanded and uh, oh yeah I think it's, even just due to you they become more popular as people keeping mm-hmm. them because people are getting into them a lot more I think a lot of those old myths are realizing well it's probably a lot of you know not quite accurate husbandry methods that were making these mm-hmm. animals a little bit more aggressive and whatnot. But I, I think one quote that I loved from the chapter of false water cobras was keeping false water cobra, cobras makes a herpiculturalist a better snake keeper, or want to be a better snake keeper. Can you yeah. des- describe why you say that? Sure. Uh, the thing that I have always found most fascinating about these snakes is their cognitive abilities. Uh, a lot of the research we've actually done here at the university has shown, and, and we have one study that's happening right now as we're recording this. One of my grad students is gathering the data uh, that we've been able to show using con- confirmed methods that these snakes have differing levels of boldness. Um, personality is a pretty strong word to use in animal biology, but but we are we've been able to show that some false water cobras are absolutely what we would call shy. Some of them are curious. Some of them are are almost derpy in the way that they approach things. Some of them are bloodthirsty killing machines. Some of them are um, afraid of their own shadow. And, and so when you have kind of that spectrum of behavioral biology and you're into maintaining animals in human care – they're going to challenge you. And, and that's what I really like about them. And the other thing about them is, given their size, you just simply cannot give an adult female false water cobra enough room until you give them a, a room-sized enclosure. Mm-hmm. And so you as a keeper, if you're going to do the animal justice, you have to come up with mechanisms to honor that behavioral complexity. And so this is a snake that you let roam a room. This is a snake that you can target train. This is a snake that you can uh, give in items of enrichment into the enclosure and they're actually going to engage it. Um, one of the things that's happened recently in herpetoculture is I, I feel that we've we've kind of taken things like evidence-based husbandry and we've almost we, we, we've gone too far with it and that is possible where we can almost weaponize it. And then when you weaponize it and you use it in an argument as to why you should keep snakes this way, you're going to turn everybody off that's on the fence, whether I should do this or not. Yeah. False water cobras, you're never going to, you if, if you are keeping a false water cobra the right way, you're going to be doing those things. And you're going when you're challenged with, with that whole aspect of evidence-based husbandry, the evidence is going to be literally smacking you in the face. <laughs> yeah. Like I have to let this thing out. I have yeah. to let this animal roam around. I have to let it use its brain to investigate its environment. And they will. That's the best part. Yeah. Um and, and so that is the part of this that that has just absolutely been wonderful, amazing, and they will forever be my favorite snake because of that. Well, they are uh, an incredible species, and the timing of this podcast is perfect because earlier today I was at a friend's house who shut out the Prairie Exotics. They have this uh, sort of sanctuary animal mm-hmm. education place, and they just recently got a false water cobra in, as well as like a litter or a clutch of, uh, of a few new babies. You know, there's seven mm-hmm. or eight younger babies. It's the first time I'd ever seen one, so it was a full-grown female, and then these little babies. So I got to kind of play with those, and it, they, it's amazing just 
the power and the size yes. and uh, the one the female did hood up. She's relatively new, so I think she's still a little bit mm-hmm. tentative. So that was kind of cool to see. And yeah, it's just it's just an incredible species. And then you think about like if I'm gonna give somebody a recommendation for a pet, you have an animal that's <laughs> large, powerful, eats a ton, <laughs> poops everywhere, needs arboreal space and a large <laughs> water feature. I'm like, this is X is all over the place. <laughs> yes, exactly. So because of that, you I do I don't think false water cobras should be your first snake. I, I, I think that you need no. some experience under your belt. Uh, but the, the thing that's great is a lot of species, in my experience, I, I've given them decked out naturalistic enclosures and we've given them choice and control in that scenario. And they will certainly use that space. But they might, over the course of a year, if I give a, a fancy background or I put a bunch of cork tubes in there, or give a water feature, they might go and utilize that space maybe two percent of the year okay Mm -hmm. if you put something novel into a false water cobra's enclosure and it's a healthy false water cobra it's going to investigate that novel item maybe within five minutes of it being in there and it's going to come back to it time and time and time again uh and and so they're rewarding in that regard uh because if you give them you know if you try to better their experience their experience will be bettered because they will utilize whatever strategy you are employing. The only time that doesn't work is if your animal's stressed out, it's sick, something about the husbandry's off. And that's another thing that makes them a better, that they make their keepers better, is you can get lulled into this sense of complacency with a false water cobra because their feeding response is so insane that, oh, it's going to eat every single time. And so then when you go and you actually go to feed the animal and it doesn't doesn't eat or you don't see those kind of intrins uh, those inquisitive behaviors you know as a keeper almost immediately something's wrong Mm -hmm. and so then you start troubleshooting it and and in that process you can when you dial in your husbandry and you get it right again it's not kind of this long gradual process to them feeding again it's almost immediate so like one of the things that happened with the false water cobras I have them at my house and I have them in this office we're recording right now. And and what would happen is the animals at school, uh, they've always eaten. There's never been an issue with, with them since 2017. I mean, literally like as long as I've had them, there's been, uh, they've been raging, but at my home, they would go, everything would be great. And then randomly, boom, they go off food and they'd go on these hunger strikes and it would, it would drive me insane. And so I had to troubleshoot and figure out what is wrong. And I knew they, it, it, I knew I would be able to figure it out ultimately. And what it was in the end, and this is how I figured this piece of their husbandry out, nighttime low temperatures are real important to these animals. Mm-hmm. Everybody was fixating on the daytime high. But when I started throwing govies in the enclosures, it wasn't until I downloaded those and I realized, well, the the room that I'm keeping these animals in it's dropping down to like 66, 67 degrees at night. And they have a tendency to go off of food if you drop below 70 degrees as a nighttime low. At least they do in my home. And so I thought, well, that's funny. Maybe I'll kind of fix that. So I went out and bought a herp stat and did the whole ramping thing and made sure that the nighttime lows weren't dropping below 70 degrees. And within 48 hours of that change, Everybody started eating again. Uh, I had verification that I was on to something. And ever since that, I haven't had any issue. So it's they're rewarding to keep because it's not like many python species that I've kept. They go on a hunger strike. It's half a year before they eat again. And you don't know why the hell they choose that you random Tuesday to eat. It, you, yeah. <laughs> it just seems so freaking random. Yeah. Like, you know. And with these animals, I was able to like dial in one piece, take one piece out. And when I finally got it all dialed in, there was kind of instant gratification. So, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of wanted to dwell on the the intelligence piece because it's kind of funny because I was I, as I was thinking about it, you think, well, I don't really notice. You don't think of snakes having different levels of intelligence across the species, but then, but we do think that for birds, for example, like we know yeah. parrots, for example, are very smart. So it's not mm-hmm. inconceivable at all to know that or to, to to suggest that one species might be very smart. And I think this probably bleeds into the natural history of the animal as well. But one thing that I found really fascinating in in the book is you talk about the target training that you guys are doing with Lori and. You your, your student, um, 
there was a section where you were talking about you were rewarding the animal with activity and uh-huh. it was actually preferring the activity over food, which sounds really bizarre because I imagine yes. like when I let my, I have a boa that does the same thing. It doesn't matter what I do to her enclosure. She needs out like every, every couple of days or, you know, once a week or something. Mm-hmm. And I assume that when she's doing that, she's looking for food. But now after, after reading that, I'm like, maybe that's not the case. So I don't know. How do you interpret that? And maybe you could describe it a it little was, bit for people. It was really difficult to interpret. So uh, my former gra- graduate student, she has since graduated. Uh, Michelle Williams, uh, she was the first individual that we used false water cobras for her graduate degree. And what I wanted to do is I basically wanted to to kind of take all the target training uh, that I was seeing in the private sector and then take the target training that I was seeing in, the, in, in zoos with reptiles. And I just wanted to do a dedicated project where we used false water cobras for target training to kind of just talk about the process and get that that published in a more formal way. And I didn't have a student yet, and Michelle came on board, and she wanted to do uh, behavioral uh, research. And so I thought, this is perfect. We'll, we'll bring Michelle on board. And so what we did is we used classic operant or associative learning conditioning where we had a target. Um, snakes see a little bit better in the blue and green spectrum. So we used a target with a blue ball and a green ball so that they could see it. And then what we would do is we would open the tub. We were keeping the babies in, in racks because you know, it's just part of science. We had to deny too much stimulation mm-hmm. so we could get a response uh, to the, the behaviors that we were, we were trying to, to get. And so we would open the tubs randomly throughout the day. So they're learning that the action of opening the tub doesn't necessarily mean food. And then you open the tub, present the target, and then when they come and touch the target, you you feed them. And so that was the first thing we did. They learned that remarkably quickly. Uh, And I tell everybody that gets a false water cobra from me, like, go ahead and try to target train it because it's a lot of fun. It also can help aid in accidental bites because they have such a strong feeding response that if you open the enclosure and shove your hand in, and you're just throwing prey in, they'll they'll bite that, but they will learn this ball shows up, food's coming next, which is mm-hmm. kind of cool. So then in zoos, zoos focus a lot on shifting animals. So basically getting the animal to kind of move on its own from one place to another. So we had taught them what the target had meant. And so what we were then doing is we were using the target to then have the snake come out to the target, follow the target into a shifting container, which is just a tub, Put a lid on the animal. Well, then the the snake has to go somewhere. So we're learning. We're, we're we're basically getting them out of the tub, and that somewhere was just a simple activity tent. We we had a random tent near the enclosure, and Michelle was moving them to the tent. She put them in the tent, let them slither around for a little while, and then we would go in. and The idea was present the target. They're going to come to the target again. Shift back into the box. Well, what we ended up have happening is we'd put them in that tent and you'd present the target. They'd look at the target. They'd kind of head towards the target. And then it was almost, you could, I'm anthropomorphizing, but you almost see it with their behavior. They'd like slow down and be like, eh, I guess I didn't get a mouse the last time I went to this target. And it's kind of cool over there. And then they would go back to the cork tubs and just mm-hmm. slither all over the place. So the problem was getting them back into the, the container because they basically had figured out that if I see the target when I'm in the tub, I can get food. But if I see the target when I'm out of the tub, it doesn't necessarily mean food. And if it comes between maybe getting food and slithering around this activity tent, I'm in the tent, so I might as well keep slithering. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, if they were indiscriminate killing machines, if there wasn't anything going on upstairs, when you would present that target, they'd attack it and want food every single time. Right. And so what was really fun, though, is while Michelle's doing that, I was writing the False Water Cobra chapter. And there's this uh, article that came out where they looked at the feeding biology and prey items of all of these xenodontine snakes in South America. And they were basically looking at a, a snake community to kind of model the way ecologists do what ecological groups or guilds do these snakes fulfill and what was really interesting is there's 
there's this idea of prey evenness. So they were looking at basically stomach contents of all these different snakes from South America. And what they found is when you took all the prey items across all the false water cobras and you made a percentage of like what percentage of the prey items were mammals, amphibians, birds, fish, false water cobras had the most even distribution of prey items, which you interpret as they can eat anything. Mm -hmm. They'll eat birds, they'll eat mammals, they'll eat amphibians, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat eels. And if you're going to be feeding across that spectrum, you have to know how to attack and kill an eel. And at the same time, how to attack and kill a rodent. And a rodent and an eel are about as different as you can get. And so you you can't you know maximize that without having some ability to learn based off of opportunity. And that's what the, the, the snakes were doing. Mm -hmm. so yeah it's so fascinating you think to to actually say or to think you know anthropomorphizing again but to, to say i'd rather stay into this activity center than potentially get food tells you that there's this uh, uh, there's some value placed on exploring new territory and maybe yeah. who knows what it is. I mean, maybe it is food associated or maybe it's shelter or something, but obviously there's a high level of, uh, of hierarchy to be able to investigate new places. Yep. Yeah. And and so one of the things that I've done resulting of that study, writing the chapter in the book is that uh, I do it every time I record a podcast here, whether it be this one or my own is I usually come up to my office an hour ahead of time and I just open the doors on the enclosures and all the snakes. Every time I record the hour before, I've got three to five gigantic false water cobras slithering around my office, which is about 12 feet long and eight feet wide. They don't seem to mind each other at all. The other fun thing about falsies is, you know, when they are uh, upset because they do the hood. So you you are able to see the emotional state of the snake. Um, and what's been real interesting is I've gotten in the habit of just leaving the doors open and they'll kind of go around for a while. And two of my animals, it's like clockwork. They come out for 20 minutes, almost on the dot. They slither around, they do their thing, and then they go right back in and they'll actually sit with just their heads hanging out of the enclosure, mm -hmm. just checking out what's going down. But it's almost like, okay, I've had enough. And at my home, um, same deal. Uh, my animals are kept in the garage, and I just kind of let them out in the garage. It's an even bigger space. Um, and and they explore, and then they put themselves back. It's yeah. it's kind of awesome. So, Well, and, and I mean, that's the experience I have with this one boa who will start mm -hmm. to glass surf and whatnot. I'll let her out. She, mm -hmm. She'll stay out for an hour or two. And I find that once I let her do that and she goes back into her enclosure, she stops glass surfing for, for it could be weeks it, yeah. it, it, uh -huh. it's very strange it's like this little bit of an outlet that she needed and I might not see that kind of str what I interpret as like slightly stressed behavior for for a long time but just giving them that opportunity is just so it's so important yes yeah, it's a hundred percent but then I have other snakes that when I give them that opportunity they don't even take it yeah like uh I have like I keep Nerodia at home um uh, and what's fun about that is I've a couple of my water snakes have gotten pretty hefty. I got them when they were small and they just keep growing. And so I, I, I for lack of a better word, feeling bad. So I opened up the enclosure. I was like, all right, guys, do what you got to do. And I, I cohab those. And they both just sit with their heads hanging out of the enclosure. Mm -hmm. They've never left the enclosure once. They, they have the ability to leave. Um, and it's almost like, nope, I'm cool. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it it's kind of interesting to me how i think that we need to get out of the habit of this kind of broad brush approach that this is the way and that we just simply let the animals tell us what they need mm -hmm. instead of letting each other kind of battle it out and figure out what they need yeah exactly that makes each, sense. each an <laughs> each individual animal is going to be different not necessarily you can't mm -hmm. paint all even the same group of yeah. species with the same brush and and then as far as i mean i think that you kind of alluded to this with their diet being so variable and whatnot and and this probably plays to their intelligence but just their natural history their their native range that they live in it just seems like it's just whatever <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. like it, it's, yeah, just, it's, it's pretty variable broad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's another thing. I, I talk about it at great length in the book is are these things generalists or are these things specialists? Because, you know, they're specialists, they're habitat specialists that are dietary generalists. 
mm-hmm. which is just crazy. Like that, that, that happens and it doesn't happen at the same time. So basically what they need in South America is water. If there's a somewhat permanent water, hydrogenasties will be there. And, and, and one of the great, one of the moments or, or, or one of the crazy things about this particular effort is I've never been to South America. So the first book that I wrote, I had a million moments. That's not an underestimate of like getting done and, and just thinking like, is this how it really is? Like I, I haven't been to Paraguay. Yeah. Like my number one goal in life right now, now that this is out, I want to go to Paraguay or Northeastern Argentina where all of the animals that I wrote about in the book for the most part live and then just go see them. Cause, cause that's the one, one part of this effort that um, is just crazy to me is I wrote it literally as a herpetoculturalist. Like I, I maintain them all. I bred them all. I, I keep them all the, the natural history part, which is normally my safe spot and my, and my jam. That was just reading from the literature, communicating with a w- bunch of wonderful biologists in South America uh, that were very gracious with their time and would, would talk to me. Um, but now it's like, I have to get there. There's yeah. no way I will die unhappy if I don't make it there. And I have to find a false water cobra in the wild. Um, that just simply has to happen. Like yeah. that's just all there is to it. I'm sure it will. And then you're going to have to go, mm-hmm. Oh, got to rewrite that chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I didn't understand how that grass mm-hmm. looked as, as mm-hmm. far as the water feature in captivity. I mean, yes. in the book, there's some beautiful pictures of incredible enclosures. So when people buy the book, mm-hmm. they'll be able to see those. But w- what do you do? Like, for example, the ones that are behind you or in, sure. in your office, what, what are, what, what do you do for a water feature? So due to the fact that they will defecate in their water and when an eight foot false water cobra goes to the bathroom, it's equivalent to a small dog crapping. <laughs> the idea of having filters and and pumps and, and and things like that, it's a little bit dangerous because if they go to the bathroom and they clog a, a filter, they might, you know, clog the intake tube. But if it's coming out of a sump, it's going to keep pumping in. And the next thing you know, you have an overflow. Yeah. So what I've done is a trim is a lot of dump and fill. So I, I use rather large bus bins um and then they will soak in those and then they go to the bathroom and then i try to dump and fill you know at, at bare minimum once a week if they don't defecate in it but if they defecate in the water it's pretty much instant because it smells so yeah. if you don't get rid of the the fecal material it's going to smell in my office for the record has an a bit of notoriety for being the smelly one because of all <laughs> the large snakes that live in it uh but there are people that have actually, in my opinion, gone well beyond me and built small room enclosures and then built pools in off of the, the small enclosures. There's a, a, a young woman named Anki uh, who I, I believe she's in Belgium. Yeah. Um, who has, in my opinion, the ultimate false water cobra enclosure. Uh, and she actually has built into it a 70 gallon aquarium that's decked out with vegetation and she posts all the time her false water cobra swimming and investigating things underwater which uh has always made me think and devise how the hell am i going to do that yeah. <laughs> so it is anyway. a crazy enclosure like when you look <laughs> yes, at that thing you're like wow that mm-hmm. looks like a zoo maybe i'll see if yeah. i can contact her and get the, those photos thrown into the into the video mm-hmm. because yeah i've seen i've seen her post on facebook too and yeah it's uh it, it is an amazing thing so if you're somebody who wants to dig into a massive project this is a perfect species it's perfect you. species if you're someone that's not quite thinking they can handle that this is like a way yeah. too much going on and what we've done here at the school in particular is this is where the, the breeders are kept. And I have the large females or what I keep in my office, but um, we have a large walk-in enclosure in one of our classrooms. It's uh, eight feet long, about five feet deep and about eight feet tall. So it's a pretty large space. And we do cohab the false water cobras. And so we have our male breeders in that particular enclosure. And one of the things that I I, I find quite endearing about false water cobras is we, they're a large heavy bodied snake. Um, Almost all of the records from nature of this animal that are published anyway, are from the animal basically being on the ground or in water, but our males 
almost daily will go up. And there's been plenty of times that I've walked into that classroom and, and, and looked in it. It was initially for the university sloth. So that ought to give you an idea of, you know, what this cage was, or enclosure was built for initially. And you'll see, you know, one male false water cobra up to the top left and then another male false water cobra off to the, the right. And they go up and down through those branches all throughout the day. So if you're looking for a, a snake that, you know, if you want to build a real impressive enclosure to have a real impressive animal that uses the enclosure, uh, this is definitely a taxa that kind of checks all those boxes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and one more question about just husbandry in general that I picked up sure. from the book is the um, the superworms. That's something that I've not yes. heard of. So can you describe that? Sure. So uh, one issue, I, I every time I'm on any kind of podcast talking about false water cobras, it seems like at least 20% of the podcast is spent talking about their poop. <laughs> because it is absolutely... A, a aspect of their care that you just have to be willing to face right from day one. And they eat a lot and they defecate a lot. And when they defecate and they're large, it's a large amount of, of material. And so you have to have some mechanism to deal with the defecation when you're not around. At least I did if I wanted to stay married. So, <laughs> So I was uh, early on before my snakes even got huge. I knew this was an issue. I was digging in on bioactivity and uh, I purchased my initial stock from one of the gurus of false water cobras, uh, a, a wonderful guy named Kyle Wilson. And I was talking to Kyle and he kept, kept a lot of large colubrids. He also had uh, black milk snakes and yellowtail cribos. And I just asked him, do you do anything to deal with this? crap for like, <laughs> and, and he was like yeah i throw super worms into the cage and they basically are kind of like giant springtails and i thought huh so i went to my local show bought a thousand uh super worms came back and i started just basically seeding all the enclosures the exact way you would seed with isopods um and sure enough they don't get rid of the fecal mass entirely. But when they go to the bathroom, um, about 50 super worms will be on that fecal mass within, within 10 minutes. Easy. Really? And I mean, they're coming from like six feet, eight feet away uh, because that's how big the enclosures are that I have. And they basically feed from the bottom up and they're eating um, the, the moist part of the feces, which is where the bacteria is. And the bacteria in particular is, is what's responsible for the bulk of the smell. So they don't get rid of the smell, but they help take the, the edge off of the smell, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And I know that the superworms are the contributing factor because a couple times uh, I, I've had a colony collapse in an enclosure and it wasn't there. And then I left on a trip and be it the animals in my office at school or the animals in my garage at home. Whichever entity that happened in, I'm hearing from them. Like, what is this odor that is coming out? You know, so I, I know that the, the superworms are, are working. So, you know, little tidbits of wisdom like that that you can't get from without real world experience with these snakes. I tried to cram as many of those nuggets into the uh, book as possible. And I also tried whenever possible to give the people that taught me those nuggets. Um, credit. So yeah. one of the really, really cool things I think about this that I'm, it's one of the things I'm most proud of is that while I wrote the book, the greater community of people that actually maintain these snakes, because they're all, all the species in the book, they all have like a core group of people here in the States and in, in Europe that are kind of the, the unsung advocates uh, of this particular, you know, species. I, 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 I know them all now. I communicated with them all and I tried to like, you know, give them credit for some little bit of herpetocultural wisdom that they contributed. So Yeah. Yeah, that's what's amazing. And and for mm -hmm. the listeners, we've basically only kind of briefly talked about the two chapters. So there's, mm -hmm. there's like 80% left of the book. So there's just so much oh, yeah. in this book. You really packed a ton in it. And you had Marco Shea write the foreword. So maybe you could, yes. how, how did that come about? That was insane. <laughs> so I grew up in the early, um, you know, in the early 2000s, I was in college and 
I distinctly remember, and and it was either 96 or 97, when this crazy new channel came out called Animal Planet. Yeah, you know, I was hooked because it was just called Animal Planet. That was all it needed to be called for me to watch it. And like late at night, there was this crazy guy on there that would catch crocodiles that ultimately ended up being Steve Irwin. So I watched all those, you know, early herp oriented personalities that were on Animal Planet like a like like you wouldn't believe. Um, but then Marco Shea's Big Adventure came on when I was in college and I wanted to be a herpetologist. And uh, he was showing like real herpetology in the field. Mm-hmm. Like one of the things I will never forget about that show is you did not know if Marco Shea was going to find the animal or not. And if he he would go out and say, we're looking for this species. And after watching it for an hour, you'd be, he'd be like, well, sorry, didn't find it. That's mm-hmm. what it's like to be a scientist. And that to me was so authentic and so awesome. And and it just kind of spoke volumes. And then he was also going out for these like super obscure herps in really obscure places. And it was a herp nerds herp show. So I watched all of them multiple times. So we knew we had to get a forward because we had to get people to want to buy the book and get some kind of somebody backing it. And, uh, I was talking to Russ and I, I, you know, I'm kind of new on all this new on this scene. And so I said, who do we, he said, well, we got to write a forward. Do you know anybody? And I said, no, I, I don't have a clue. And he just like, as casual as could be said, Oh, well, maybe I'll see if Mark will do it. And I thought, who's this Mark guy he's talking about. <laughs> and I asked, well, well, who's that? And he goes, Oh, you know, Mark O'Shea. And you know, like, one of my heroes and idols is going to write the forward to the first book that I write. That's not intimidating at all. Um, and so I just sat there and he sent off the email to Mark and then Mark wrote back and said, I'd love to do it. And we, but he said under one condition and, and the condition was that he had to kind of give the book his stamp of approval um, for him to, to write a forward, which is totally fair. And what was really interesting about that process is we gave Mark th- th- this first chapter that you read. And if you read it, it reads like a snake nerd is writing it. It it, it intentionally doesn't read like a herpetologist is writing it mm-hmm. because I have those books at home and some of them are great, but a lot of them are not a joy to read. <laughs> so, um, and they oftentimes kind of cut out the gory details that people really want to kind of dig into. And so we we got this email back from Mark and Mark basically said, like, I don't know what's going on with this book, um, but I've made quite a few comments. Please address these comments before we move forward. And my heart kind of sank. And I was like, oh, God, you know, what the hell is happening? Um, And it in the first series of comments were like, don't understand what you're saying here. Don't understand your tone. What is the tone? And then you get all the way out. The first chapter is 42 pages long. I think it was on page like 38 where there's a new comment and it goes, I think this book is supposed to be fun. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, cool. He gets it now. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, it, 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 but it was just really funny because we didn't explain to him who the target audience was at first. And so I think he thought we were literally writing like the book on Xenodontines. And that was not really the goal. The goal was to write a, a fun book for herp nerds that keep these snakes um, and give them the information they need to, to keep them to the best of their ability. And so once that was understood, uh, the process became much better. But it was really fun because uh, Mark O'Shea is British and I am American. And in case you didn't know it, Brits use the English language in a different way than Americans do. <laughs> so there was quite a lot of like back and forth as to whether like spell behavior this way. And I was like, well, no, we're going to spell behavior that way. So there was like that kind of thing. And then the thing that I was most impressed with is there are so many genus names in this book. It is ridiculous. Mm. Uh, I counted it at one time and I think there's over 250 taxonomic terms. Mark O'Shea is not just a a TV personality. He is a full-blooded, 100% authentic herpetologist, 100%. um, And his encyclopedic knowledge of the correct spelling of every taxonomic name 
is one of the most impressive things I've seen among any zoologist I've worked with. Uh, he would catch little typos with these genus names um, that Russ and I missed like five times. <laughs> that <laughs> is caught, insane. It is nuts. I don't know how the hell he did it, uh, but he did it. And so by him working on it, the book became, you know, awesome. But what was most, what was, was most interesting is as, you know, we were doing the revision process. It was almost like I had a mentor and how to write a reptile book because he's written a lot of reptile books. So he would make suggestions, well, you know, consider taking this paragraph this way instead of leaving it the way it is because you'll lead the reader to this. Uh, and so I became a much better writer as a result of this process. And it was, like I said, the, the, like I, I said early on or before we uh, started recording, um, this was without question the most enjoyable academic enterprise I have ever undertaken in my life. It was just fun. I'm a lifetime learner. So I, I, I learned and I feel like it's completely prepped me for the hognose snake book, which I am like chomping at the bit to get cranking on that one because the, the void of this book where I don't have the field experience, I have plenty of field experience now with heterodon. So, you know, I, I feel like I am completely rounded and prepped. Uh, yeah. to begin that. And unfortunately, I've got to get a bunch of graduate students out the door this semester. So I can't start. And, you know, priorities have been a, a royal pain for me because I'll, I'll sit down and I'm like, Oh, I've got two hours. I could, I could start the Hognos book. And then I'm like, uh, I need to read Megan's thesis. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to get a bunch of them out the door so I can begin writing that one in January. Well, that'll be really exciting. I mean, I can't wait to get my hands on the physical copy of this book as well. And, and uh, the heterodon book will be really cool, especially me. Yeah. I, I live in the native range of, uh -huh. the, of the Western Hogno. So that's kind of a cool aspect as well. Most books that I have yes. are like, you know, tropical book, whatever. Um, that, that I just, I'm super excited. And I think uh, I'm sh I can tell the community is insanely excited as well because it just created so much buzz. And, and uh, have you got rid of all the 100 signed copies? Have people already uh claimed those? At this point, we're, we're down to like crumbs. In fact, Russ and I have kind of put a pause on those because mm. we want to make sure that we have all of his and I have and he has all of mine. So we don't we didn't like tell somebody. Yeah, we've got one available. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's totally worth reaching out, but we still have hardbacks. Uh, the hardbacks are going to go quick, but softbacks, we have quite a few softbacks. So uh, there, there are they are available, but. If you're interested in the book, um, you need to reach out to me specifically through Instagram or Facebook uh, so I can get you on the list and we can get the book out the door to you. Is that, That's not the only way to purchase the book, though, right? Or Well, that's right just for now it copies. is. Oh, okay. Right now okay. it is because we're trying to control what gets out there. Mm, uh, gotcha. We are, we are going to open – well, Russ has informed me because Russ handles the sales, but I'm having people contact me. Because uh, I'm maintaining the spreadsheet for us both. But right now, it is truly a passion project. It is me and Russ doing this. Uh, we're going into Labor Day weekend this weekend. And I am going to sign as many of those books as possible and get them out the door to Russ and, you know, do the spreadsheet. But ultimately, um, the softback will most likely become available through Russ's website uh, or may be available on Amazon. We haven't decided if we're going to go that route or not. Okay, so right now, if somebody wants the book, reach out to yeah, you. Yeah, reach that's out to me directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's awesome. Well, Zach, this was an incredible conversation. I'm, the people would have gained tons from this, just from the you know the hour <laughs> and a half of talking about the book, and there's just so much more in there. Like I said, I can't wait to get my hands on the copy so I can yeah. get through those other chapters as well. Uh, before we wrap up, can we spend just a couple of minutes just talking about the zoo science program? I don't want to sure. spend too much more of your time, but last time you were on, I feel like it was just kind of firing up, and since then, it's been really oh like it's, it's expanded. So where where is it now? Yeah. It is, uh, it, it's uncontrollable energy is the way that would explain it. Like today, earlier today, I was at the groundbreaking ceremony for a $1.5 million um, Appalachian Aquatic Conservation Center that we're going to be opening for crayfish and turtle conservation. Wow. Um, so like it is, it is, I am fulfilling every childhood and professional dream that I've had with this major. Um, we are now the largest major at our university, which was interesting. I am the chair of my department, and I was sitting in an opening meeting 
And like most people that have to sit in meetings, I was listening. I wasn't necessarily giving 100% of my attention to what was going on. And they were listing the, you know, the top majors. And I was, I've heard it a million times, nursing, dental hygiene. And somebody, you know, said, oh, we have a new kid at the top. Zusai is now the largest major and you know, has the most students in it. And I, I almost lost, like, I was like, wait, what? Oh, I'm in charge of that. Holy hell. So, you know, um, it, it's in a great spot. We are a small liberal arts school in Northern West Virginia. And we, with this major, we are attracting students from across the country, which is one of the coolest parts uh, about it. We have students from 20 states now. Um, we've made so many partners for our students to work with uh, that I have students that are working with the or, um, Orion Center for Indigo Conservation with Central Florida Zoo. I'm actually heading down there in two weeks to work on a, a, a master's thesis. We've just, are in the infancy of forming a relationship with the St. Augustine alligator farm, which is an AZA facility to look at Chinese or yeah, Chinese alligator and gharial, uh reproductive behavior. That's going to be two potential theses that graduate students are going to be working on where they're going to be on site um, taking data on that. We're, we're working with the Philadelphia zoo on a really cool study um, where we're going to use the false water cobras again. And we're going to look at the impact on corticosteroids. So those are hormones um, with giving snakes belly heat Mm. versus giving them radiant heat from a light bulb and just see like, is there a difference in stress level and growth and behavioral response? Um, And and that's just what we're doing with graduate students. The undergrads uh, currently our animal collection sits at about 300 species or 300 individuals. And we have around 200 taxa. Almost all of those are reptiles. If I don't know our exact number with babies right now, but let's just say it's 300. 298 of those are reptiles and amphibians. We have two mammals. Uh, so uh, it, it's perfect for anybody that wants to do herpetoculture uh, and, and do it professionally and academically. And the sky is kind of the limit. We have our partner zoo down the road where the students get to work with uh, your typical zoo animals like snow leopards and uh, zebras and emus and ostriches and all those kind of things. So it's taken us a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's not really been that long. It feels like it's been about 50 years. It's only been, <laughs> I think, since 2016. But when you open up a program like this that's so niche, uh, it, it just takes forever to figure out what the workforce for it needs to look like, how to actually create an environment where the students get that experiential learning, but they're still learning the classic zoology, evolution, organismal biology. And then the other thing that we're doing is it, we're, we're trying to get our students hyper-prepared because it's it's a well-known fact that if you work in zoos, a lot of times you're not paid very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the idea herein is that we're going to get our students the experience of working in AZA. So you're going to get that real-world experience. You're going to couple it with the academics. And then when you apply for a zoo job, you can apply for those higher paid positions uh, and have the experience you need to kind of land those. And our our students are doing that. And our students have gone on to do amazing things. I had a student, this is a tie to you, from who was originally from Canada. uh, Mm -hmm. And they came down here and her name was Kate. And Kate rather infamously said within the first month, I want to go to Africa and study giraffes. And so I told her, well, that's a very lofty goal. (laughs) <laughs> but we can do it if you do A, B, C, one, two, three. And and Kate did everything that we asked of her. And, you know, one of the fun things about West Lib is that we you are not a number here. Like, I know, even though I have the largest major, by the time those students graduate, I know everything about them. They know everything about me. And I'm there to help guide them and get them to where they want to go. And with Kate, we found a lab in Africa, or Kate found a lab in Africa. And she said, this professor's talking to me. And myself and another professor here was like, we're going to make this happen. And now Kate is in Africa using radio telemetry, coming up with a management plan for her master's degree with giraffes. So like, that's just one example of, of it. And I have countless examples. So the students that come here, the ones that are willing to put in the work, I've got to say that, mm-hmm. you know, we, they, they, they ultimately go on to do great things and it's been that as a as a professor teacher the book is great writing the papers is great 
but I mean, you're a coach, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing better than investing your time in a young person and, and seeing it when they get it. And then they kind of go and, and they achieve their dream or passion. That is why I do what I do. Like it is, yeah. it is the best thing in the world to see. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's, mm-hmm. it's it seems like such an obvious model that for some reason just hadn't been really done. And now, even back in 2020, even though the program was a couple of years in, it just seems like now it's just hit, it's like uh, hit another yep. gear. And mm-hmm. you have, uh, I mean, I guess time, everything's going to mature. You're going to have people moving through the program. So it's just so cool to see that. Um, if someone's listening that says, wow, I, that sounds incredible. How do I find more information about that? What would they do? The, the easiest, I'm, I'm all about pragmatism. So I don't really need a, 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 an uppity, uptight email. A lot of people think like, he's Dr. Loafman. I tell everybody I'm just Zach. <laughs> like, I just happen to be a guy that has a PhD. Um, but the best way to get a hold of me is if you have a social media presence, if you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, just simply message me. It's it's Zach Loafman. Uh, several of the current Zusai grad students Heard me on podcasts, so this is a this is a very important way for me to get potential students. Because if you made it this far with us talking about snake taxonomy as long as we did, I probably want you to be my grad student. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but you know I, it has to be a good fit. But we'll communicate, and then we go from there. And then if you're listening to this and you're in high school, for the love of God, if you want to do herpetoculture, come here because we are doing herpetoculture we do herpetoculture just to do herpetoculture and we do herpetoculture to better herpetoculture with science you know the whole spectrum is here so by all means hit us up awesome well zach i think we've covered tons today if people are interested in the book they'll contact you if they're interested in a degree they'll contact you <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we i don't think there's anything else to, to chat about this this was fantastic you already mentioned both uh, zach lofman i'll make sure that's in in the show notes but zach lofman on instagram and facebook is where people can yeah. find you and is there any website or anything no just no. just when you're on instagram um my 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 handle there is dr crawdad because that's what i was told to do Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so you can awesome. find me there with that one as well. And it's really funny because, well, my name's Doctor Crawdad. I think ninety-five percent of the photographs and reels are snakes. That's right. So, yeah, you can see where your heart that. really is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Zach, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. We'll definitely do this again. We won't wait for two and a half years this time, yes. but uh, we'll, we'll definitely hit you up again. And before you have that hog nose book too, but of course sure. we'll bring you back on for that too. So, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. No, it was that the pleasure was all mine, Dylan. I, I, when, when I knew the book was coming out and I thought, okay, who would I like to talk to about it? I instantly thought of your podcast and the people, uh, that, that listen to it because I really feel like this book is, is written for them. And mm-hmm. then as, as well as the people that listen to my podcast, which is the next podcast I'm recording to talk about the book. So there you go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, uh, first, thank you so much for thinking of me. I, I love that. Mm-hmm. And, but can you please plug your podcast too? I think oh, many people will already know about it, but I wanted to, I wanted to yeah. make sure that we got that in. Well, well, now that we went over all of that gobbledygook at the front end of the, 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 it, the, the name of the podcast will make a whole lot of sense. So the podcast is Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. And the reason why we named it that is Colubrid is for all the Colubridy. And then the Colubroid is for the Dipsadids and Nitracids and, and Semophids and all the other things that used to be in Colubrid, but Colubridy, but are now given their own family. So it's the colubroid snakes is 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 what we cover in that and it's um i, I love my co-hosts uh the first series of episodes we recorded was with M- matt most but matt's job has become insane and and so we have a another co-host on board now who's just a ton of fun um clint bartley and mostly now it's clint and i recording and we tackle any kind of colubrid we we do all forms of keeping and we also do a lot of um the ethics of herpetoculture and and why we do what we do and what we shouldn't do to make it so we can keep doing what we do. (laughs) So there you go. Well, everyone go check out that as well. And I will let you get on with the rest of your night, Zach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure was mine. All right, that brings us to the end of that episode. Zach, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast again. And also, just thank you for writing this book. I know it's going to be a massive hit within the herpetoculture community. And it's a fascinating read for what I've read so far. I can't wait to get my physical copy in the mail. Hopefully, it will be in the next week or so. And uh, I just can't wait to sink my teeth into the other chapters as well. 
And as I said, we will absolutely have you back on, and I cannot wait to see the Hog Nose book come into fruition as well. Listeners, as we said at the very end, if you are interested in this book or purchasing this book, which you should be, make sure you send Dr. Loafman a message on either Instagram or Facebook. I will make sure all of that is in the YouTube description or the show notes on www.animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find all of that there. And again, this is a great book to have within your library. If you're someone like me, it's just nice to have a bunch of books in the space of herpetoculture, just reptiles and amphibians in general. And this is one that you will definitely want to have in your collection. So send him a message if you're interested in the book. If you're interested in finding more information on this podcast, again, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. I did want to say for those who are still sticking around, I will be at the Canadian Reptile Breeders Expo on September 15th. Is it September? September 16th and 17th. So if you are going to be in Toronto for that, make sure you come say hi. We'll have a booth set up there. We'll be doing some live recording as well. So I would love to meet you. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. And finally, thank you so much to everyone who supports me on Patreon. You really do help keep the show moving. YouTube is such a variable thing. Some months I make a decent amount of money. I shouldn't say decent. It's pretty small. But some months I make almost nothing off YouTube. So it goes from being a small amount to being almost nothing. And to have the patrons consistently supporting me the patrons consistently supporting me allows me to rely on that and continue to produce the show because youtube is a very unreliable cash source for this uh, endeavor that we're going on so anyway thank you everybody who has watched the show if you did enjoy this make sure you share it around again that's one way we can get this on more eyes is just sharing it on instagram facebook and so on and i will catch you guys in the next episode